Hi, this is the Data Leaders Podcast. This is your host, Les Muller. And today on the show, I have Catherine Schwann. Catherine is the Analytics Business Management Director for Europe over at Boston Consulting Group. Catherine, welcome on the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, we, we love to have you. And uh, for the audience members who do not yet know uh, who you are, uh, can you just tell us a bit about your background and your journey of, of becoming a data leader? Sure. So um, my career as a data leader started about 16 years back. Um, I graduated from one of the private universities in um, Germany, majored in economics, minored in quantitative marketing, and then I started right out at consulting. Um, Back then, uh, it wasn't about big data just yet. Um, yet, I wanted to work in the online sphere. So, and I got the chance after three and a half years to move on to Yahoo. And I became one of their first business analysts in Germany. Um, and I worked for them in the search and media business and got to see all the business in Europe um, through some projects I did for them. Um, and then I had the chance to move on and build my own web analytics and data science team over at a small agency serving external clients. So I kind of switched from being hands-on within operations to serving as a consultant again. Um, and we worked like clients like Payback and Pro7, Set1, which is a big media conglomerate. Um, and then after about three and a half years again, I moved on back to the operations and got the chance to join Criteo which is a French company, uh, one of the largest purchases of online inventory with Google and Facebook. Um, and they are in the ad tech sphere. And I got the chance to build the data science teams first in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and then in Europe and um, Latin America. And finally, I got to work for them as a VP data analytics and data science for the Americas. Um, and I got to reshuffle their data science organization over there. So pretty exciting journey, um, switching sides, and I'm all into data. So you can see I've, um, I've seen, I've pretty much seen all the facets of it. Definitely an exciting journey. And uh, I would uh, actually have quite a few questions. First of all, what compelled you to, to start a career in data? So that was actually one eye opener that I had at Yahoo. Um, I didn't always aim to be a data specialist, yet at Yahoo, I did as part of a project, um, a small analysis, and that small analysis rendered so much additional revenue that they could have paid me for three additional years. So in like three days work, I earned three times my annual salary for them, just with one little analysis. And that was just big eye opener for me. And from that day onwards, I was like, well, this, this is great. I need to tap into this. So that's it. It, it really displayed the potential in data, right? Crazy, it crazy did. ROI. <laughs> and, it did. And, and that switch between, you know, being more operational and actually moving on to helping uh, clients. So what, uh, you know, steered you towards that direction? So, I really like the chance to be put on your toes because these clients obviously expect you to work on time on budget, whereas data sometimes lures you into exploration, which can lead to unlimited amounts of time that you dump into it without not necessarily going for a result. Um, and I really wanted to be able to balance these two, let's say opposite points a bit better. And that's why I, chose to switch from the operations within Yahoo to the client facing role with budget restraints and time restraints on the agency side. And uh, I imagine that your current role also definitely, you know, keeps you on your uh, toes. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about this specific responsibility and, and, and what does it cover? So um, it definitely keeps me on my toes. Um, BCG is probably one of the most demanding environments. Uh, we are um, building the analytics practice within BCG. We're service, servicing the case teams, um, which can be very demanding. They are themselves under high pressure from clients that expect good results in pristine condition pretty much yesterday. Um, so this is the pressure that we also feel. Um, and to adhere to that and to deliver on that promise and 
exceed expectations, you, you really have to focus your organization around, okay, what's needed, what's priority, um, what time frame do we work in, what are the restrictions, um, and that's what I have been looking for, um, building an organization with these high benchmarks to me. It sounds sounds uh, very challenging, but at the same time, an exciting uh, opportunity as well. And I imagine that uh, you really need to tap into, uh, you know, all the experience and knowledge and skills uh, that you have to actually succeed in an environment like this. I mean, uh, what were some of the major successes uh, over your career that you think that you know really contribute to now you being able to succeed? So. There were several. So I used to start out in consulting. Um, and I think my, one of my biggest successes was after a very challenging project that the client asked the entire team to come over to their side. So basically they wanted to hire us, which, which is something where I say, okay, that's the highest price you could probably receive um, for your work. So that was one. Uh, the second one, one was that I went to the sales side when I was working at the agency. I had to sell my own business. I had to come by my own business to build and feed my team. And when I sold my first 1 million euro project, that was one of my biggest successes then because I said, hey, well, I did it. I did it in sales. I can actually sell this stuff. So, and I had to deliver the projects. So I was not just, you know, selling hot air, but I, I was really kind of in up to my, up to my, roots so so I, I i was i had to show what i sold so um that was then the third thing i learned don't over promise don't under scope it so um these are just like two incidents where um where i had experiences that actually helped me in my current role definitely and it's uh, definitely something uh, to be proud of and also i think you uh, gave a very good advice there of you know never uh, over promise Right, so uh, yeah. under promise and over deliver. That's uh, that's a much better recipe uh, for success. And and was it actually the project that you were most proud of because you were so uh, invested in? I I wouldn't say I was most proud of it. It was certainly one of the bigger one I sold. Um, there were other projects I was more proud of. Like for instance, for Criteo, I got the chance to to um, start up their a Middle East and Africa business. And, and that entailed doing the investment case for even opening that um, office over there and staffing it with people, coming out with a business plan for the first three years. And they actually trusted us. They, they bought the business plan, they trusted us, they advanced the money. We opened shop and it's one of the fastest growing regions today. It's a multi-million dollar business. And I'm very proud that we pulled it through because it wasn't easy to convince people. Yeah, I can imagine. It's, uh, it's definitely something to be proud of. And uh, especially, I imagine that uh, you know, it really, it must have weighed heavily on your shoulders that you have all this responsibility. And uh, in principle, you have every condition in place uh, to succeed. And uh, uh, I imagine that it was very challenging as well. I mean, what were your main challenges? So the main challenges are always to get people to trust your analysis and to trust your word, even if their gut says no. If you make it that far, then you've made it the way you need to make it. And that's, that has always been my biggest challenge. Produce something, do analysis, do modeling, make suggestions that people buy despite their gut telling them this doesn't sound right. Because if you convince them that much, then you actually educate them with data and with very good work. So, and I'm, I'm not gonna say I have achieved this always, not by far, but the, the times that I have achieved it, the stuff turned out really well. And when you achieved it, uh, what do you think that actually allowed you to do that? So were there any particular strategies, techniques, uh, skills that you think really served you well? Yes, so there are some things that have always worked or almost always worked. So what really has never failed me is ask the folks, pull them in right from the beginning, get their opinions, put yourself in their shoes, listen to their concerns and try to take them in as much as you can. If you cannot be open about it, be transparent. So if you take them with you on the journey, that has never failed me to be success, never. The second thing that I think really makes you a successful data leader is portfolio because this practice is so young you don't know what's out there the next five years. 
portfolio, get different people in different cultures, different skill sets, different interests, and listen to them, be empathic. That has never failed me either. And the third one, which can be having goods and bads, is be thorough. Be thorough and follow through, focus. Um, that can be tough for people sometimes because you have to take decisions. However, that's potentially my personal style. Um, it has worked very well for me in most occasions. So these are the three that I would pass on. Yeah, definitely. And uh, how did you learn and acquire these skills? So do you think it's uh, mainly a part of your personality? Is it something that people are born with? Or is it something that you can actually learn and then, uh, you know, acquire uh, through testing and trying? I think you can acquire some. Um, I don't have a particular talent for these things or anything. I don't believe at least I don't have them, have that. What really brought me there is a mixture of things. First of all, you know, try and fail. <laughs> you learn by tripping and falling at some point. And that has also happened to me. Um, the second one is be open and really be willing to learn. That has really helped me. It's like be sensitive to what's happening around you. Listen. Don't just think that your way is the best way because this is revolving really quickly. Um, that, has, that has also served me very well. Um, and that has kind of made up for me not being a data genius in, in most occasions because learn and handling data is not necessarily about writing the best models. It's writing the models that fit and seamlessly integrating them with where they actually add value. And you need a ton more skills than just being a good modeler for that. And definitely good advice. And uh, uh, do you have any particular examples maybe? I mean, how did you apply these skills uh, over your career to you know, overcome obstacles and, and, and succeed at the end? Mm, let me think of a good example. So um, I did one thing. I, I had to develop a, a reporting for the entire European management at Criteo which is almost impossible because you have about six leaders that have about eight opinions on how things need to be done. So what we did is like we took the long road to really ensure buy-in and that entailed fireplace talks. And I have to say, I went in there with like a pretty clear view on how this thing should be looking. And after the talks we've had, I really changed my mind. They actually convinced me for the better in more than one occasion. Um, and that was one of the things where I, I was really on my toes. I was being, I was not being over arrogant because obviously this is leadership team. So you, you have to be, you know, patient and listen and be very servicing. Um, and that also helped me as an attitude because I was open to their suggestions. And um, they also, you know, went out of their way to explain why, which is what I've asked them to do so don't just tell me what you want, tell me why you want it, because that will make it faster for every single one in this group. So that's, uh, that's one of these learning opportunities that people gave me. Fantastic. And it sounds like it definitely uh, served you well. And what do you think uh, was uh, the one thing that was um, actually holding you back? And, and uh, what did you learn from it? So... I have to admit that during the beginning of my career, I could be pretty territorial. Um, and that was definitely something that didn't work really well for me. It's something that can happen when you're very thorough and follow through person. You can become territorial because that makes things easier, right? So it, it, however, it causes a lot of anxiety with people specifically in the online world that I have worked in for more than 10 years and with data science as well. It's a special breed of people um, that do not work really well with ter territorial behavior. And that was something that I got rid of pretty quickly um, because I just tripped over my feet over and over again and it really didn't work out well so the less i was territorial the more i actually got to the point where i wanted to be um that's my advice to everyone don't you actually get further to where you want to be if you're a lot less determined about you know actually pushing it your way it sounds like valuable advice and also a very honest self-reflection uh there and what would you do more of? So what would you then prioritize? I would always prioritize to 
put yourself in somebody else's shoes and be open because no, none of us knows where this is going to be in five years, this entire topic and, and every single bit of it. Uh, so you've got to be open. You've got to listen and you've got to be empathic. So that's my advice. And the second thing I always try to do is teach the people how to fish, meaning enable them. Enable them to understand why and enable them to do it themselves. Let them trip, be there for them if they need you, but definitely relinquish control because otherwise you never come to scale and you will never make this a really broad initiative. So that's uh, kind of my advice. How to Defin go yeah, definitely good advice. And yeah, data is definitely a field uh, where you you know, you have no chance of knowing uh, how the landscape will look like uh, in a couple of years time. Actually, are there any particular trends and technologies that you are particularly interested in at the moment? Yeah, I'm very interested in technology that um, doesn't necessarily need you to move out of what you do as a working environment today, yet knits together what you are used to with what's new. And that basically takes this modular structure that we all find ourselves in. Like for instance, just communication. We're using Zoom right now. I also know Google Hangouts. I know Skype. I know Blue, Blue Jeans. There's like a ton out there. It, necessar it doesn't necessarily matter which one you use. It's just the portfolio that ties it all together and, and links it up and meshes it. Um, and that's the technology I'm really interested in. Um, also what I'm looking at right now is when is on-prem a good parameter versus cloud? What is really, because it seemed to be very driven by fashionable thoughts, like sort of like, oh, we have cloud now and everybody moves everything to the cloud. And now it's like, oh, wait a minute. There's like potentially security concerns that, I don't know, for instance, Amazon doesn't even have under their control. So everybody's like, oh, let's go back on-prem. But there's pluses and minuses to each side of that. So I'm, I'm really monitoring this very closely and seeing, okay, for which use case do we actually supervise which environment and what has worked out well and what has not served us? How can we overcome the shortcomings um, and, and gain by the positives? So that's, that's the two things that I'm particularly interested in right now. No, very interesting. Uh, I think especially uh, this topic about, you know, having data on site or having it uh, in the cloud. Uh, I can sense that you are still uh, kind of you know, assessing the situation and the future prospects, but are you leaning towards one or the other? I'm leaning towards one or the other given certain circumstances. Like for instance, in the Middle East, we have clients um, that simply have data security requirements that cannot be met through cloud providers right now. Um, so there's, that's obviously a very simple decision then because you have a clear uh, mandatory requirement that leads everything to on-prem. Now on-prem is, has like some drawbacks, scalability, you know, assets on your PNL that you have to kind of take care of. Um, so there has to be a balance between what you're going to get out of it and what you have to invest uh, to overcome these shortcomings. So um, that's one. Another one, by the way, when you, when you say that is how do you blend models or how do you blend approaches in, um, in let's say, um, algorithmic search? So is it it used to be like, okay, let's take a Bayesian tree or let's take a random forest. And what we are moving towards now is, hey, why don't we blend these things and take the best of two worlds? Then the question is, how do you blend these um, in a good way? So I can only refer to Facebook's profits model for time series, which is something where I'm like, this is a very interesting approach. It blends certain things together to overcome shortcomings of just one clean approach. So that's what I'm interested in right now. Now, this is actually a very interesting topic. Can you uh, just elaborate on this a bit more? Because uh, people in the audience might not be fully aware of this blended model at Facebook, for example. So uh, the profits model is using, is using a classical approach um, and the classical approaches when you do times here is just have some, some shortfalls. Uh, for instance, there are some unexpected, um, let's say, bumps in the, in the data that you do not anticipate by model. And they are kind of clunky to adapt to it. Like, for instance, I don't know, the most, uh, the most prominent one is probably 
if you want to take that. That's obviously not foreseeable. Um, however, what does it do for your time series data? It messes up the current year and it messes up the future year. So how do you take that into account? Or you have something where you say, for instance, when you have um, inventory analysis and you have out of stock situations that it, it's not your responsibility, it's, it's just an external factor for some reason. And that hasn't been foreseen in the model, but it's messing up the full time series. So that's something that you have to take into account in easy way. So what the profits model does is it's not requiring the analyst to be super advanced in their knowledge of statistical modeling, um, yet um, it is pretty easy even for beginners to take these, let's say, off one-offs into account in the model. And, and that's what I'm calling a very smart blend between a very advanced modeling approach, these one-off occasions and potentially an analyst workforce that's not all Nobel Prize winners. And that's really solving it very well for, let's say, companies that want to use these models for themselves. They don't all have Nobel Prize winners. They don't all have this super clean data. They still have to work with these one-off occasions that usually models do not have built in. And that's where the profits model is something where I'm saying, hey, that's, that's a super good start that's, that's a super good example of how you can marry up these um, different circumstances quite well. Hmm. And do you think... So to the Facebooks. <laughs> definitely, definitely. They, they know what they're doing. Uh, that's, that's no question. Uh, do you think that... Uh, so what other, other areas you think that this principle uh, can be applied in? So this you know, blending of different structures. I think it can be applied for sure in data engineering, um, where you usually find yourself um, with legacy systems, with legacy hardware, with legacy processes. And what you have to make do is bring the best practice to the real world. Um, and this is where we're using this approach without going into more detail here, because, you know, see us at our offices, but um, that's something where we really apply this approach um, quite often to come to a pragmatic solution and put that on a time, uh, let's say on a time series where you say, okay, we do this step now and when we've done it successfully, let's move to the next step and then let's move to the next step. Always taking into account your situation, your context. Let's not dream about how it could be. Let's work with what we have here. And then let's have that road paved out to where we want to be and do this step by step. And that's and data engineering is one of these fields where we actually apply that very often with clients. Sounds, sounds very exciting. And I imagine that you work with some, you know, very talented uh, uh, people. Uh, with impressive backgrounds as well. I mean, what do you do at the moment to educate your team and also to kind of expand the organization's skill sets as well? So what we currently do is hiring portfolio. Um, I'm getting people in that have different industry backgrounds that have actually worked in different styles. So I'm having online folks that have come from ad tech backgrounds like myself, um, married out with folks that have worked a long time in the public sector, for instance, transportation, um, that have experienced different environments. Now, what do I do to educate that team and, and actually scale these different backgrounds to, to one thing? So the one thing that we do is we, um, for instance, we have a buddy concept. So you adopt somebody else who's pretty different from yourself and you exchange. It's a pretty informal thing that's very common at BCG. Um, it's, a, it's a peer to peer knowledge transfer, if you will. And we are also using that approach when we want to roll out new tools. Like for instance, we have now decided on, um, a, on a change in the project management tooling that we do. And to roll out that new project management tool, tool we don't do centralized trainings what we do is we we do a lighthouse team and then we each of these lighthouse team members actually has one or two two peers and they do this through a peer review concept that does entail training however it does also entail a ton of hands-on work and then always coupling back with somebody you know so that your individual questions and problems and also context is taken care of by somebody who has been trained before so what you do is you basically repeat the entire thing over and over again 
snowballing it into a bigger organization. And that has proven to be a very successful approach. Um, it sounds weird at the moment because people always think like, oh, central training, you know, that's it. Are we doing 10 sessions and then everybody's going to be on the top of where they could be? Um, that's not what we found to be successful. No, it definitely and, sounds, sounds exciting. And uh, I think if not, we're definitely special, right? And, uh, and evidently, evidently it's working. How long uh, have you guys been working with this? So we've done this for about three quarters of a year um, after we have had, you know, we, we, this is BCG. So you, you know, you try everything and you, you learn every single day. So everybody's pretty open to these sorts of approaches, which I'm really graced with a very good work environment that allows me to do these things. And as you said, I'm working with very smart people. Um, so you have to take that into account because they have, a different style of learning potentially than you would usually find in organizations. You, so you can pull these things off. And that's actually an interesting topic. You said that they have different styles of learning. What styles of teaching you found to be working uh, uh, the best when you work with seasoned data professionals? What really works well is a mixture of things. Um, and one of them that at least gets the best feedback is let me watch what you do. Let me see, and then let me take the best of what you do, what suits me to, into my work style, into my approach, into how I tackle things. Um, it's this informal that you don't necessarily control with an organization that works really well. Peer-to-peer, -peer, brown bags, just having people discuss topics also works really well. This classroom thing is a tad out of fashion we found. It's still, it's still a vital part because you can obviously make sure through testing and everything that you reach a minimum level of proficiency. However, that's not necessarily what cracks the nut when it comes to the leading edge stuff. Like, for instance, the profits model was one of these things. It came out of a brown bag and then it developed itself into some sort of peer communication, some discussion, application and projects. And all of a sudden, everybody's like, hey, this is really cool. However, there are these and these and these things that we don't necessarily take and that's why and that's exactly what you want you want people to be very mindful about what they learn and that's what we have achieved in that one case well uh congratulations on achieving those results and what condition do you think made this possible from an organizational perspective i think the organization is very tolerant of these experiments and very open and they advance trust. And that's something that has tremendously helped me to thrive here. And um, I can just recommend this. If you work with these kinds of people, do it. Uh, otherwise you wouldn't have gotten them on board, right? You wanted to hire smart people. So, so in advance them that trust and trust in yourself that you've hired the right folks. That has worked for me so far. Um, I definitely try it. And, and what do you think? So for those people who are just a, a bit less fortunate than you are, and they are working in an organization that might be maybe a bit reluctant to actually, you know, adopt these uh, relatively innovative methodologies. What advice would you give to people to influence the organization so that, you know, the business will become more receptive to these? So, this is not all about, you know, friends and family and everybody hugging and loving each other all the time. That's not it. We're in a business and what counts is the bottom line. Um, so I'm not going to be fussy about that one. And what we made very, very clear from the beginning is that there is a minimum requirement. There is a minimum KPI that we have to meet all of them. These minimum KPI will consistently be rising over time. And that's that's the base rule and the ground rule that everybody has to adhere to. And I'm, I'm really firmly holding that line. So I'm there to help everyone who, you know, is making it without adopting all these fancy tools and all these approaches and everything and kind of says, hey, it's actually too much for me. Thank you. And um, that's fine. I'm, I'm super flexible with that. And the, the team is as well. As long as you achieve this minimum KPI, nobody's telling you, you have to do this. What we, what we embrace is your feedback. If you're not satisfied, tell us why. Let us work on this. 
if you're not telling, we at least expect you to meet these KPI and be aware they're increasing every single year. Yeah, putting the right KPIs in place and yeah. you know, holding the relevant parties accountable, that um, it definitely proves to be crucial. And just about KPIs. So when you choose KPIs, do you have any, uh, you know, any particular system that you, you like to use based on which you actually you know, appoint, choose and appoint those KPIs? So there's the easy ones um, that we all basically come down to, which is you have to earn your living here plus some. We are paying you really well. You obviously have to earn that plus give us, you know, something to grow that business even further and thrive. And that's, that's, that's a pretty clear economic equation, isn't it? So that's like the base level that we can all agree to. There's no misunderstanding of that. It's, it's about clear euros or dollars that come in for every single resource in a certain amount of time. And then we derive from that, we derive KPI because that's a lagging indicator, obviously, you know, that is the outcome of things that you do right beforehand. Um, and frankly, I'm not at liberty to go into like all the detail on them. However, they have a lot to do with um, what kind of projects are you doing? How advanced are they on our analytics scale in terms of complexity, modeling that you use, um, complexity across functions as well? Are you just writing the model or are you also entailing rolling it out to the organization, coaching, training, um, selling potentially selling, upselling, cross-selling this stuff. So that's all being taken into account. And that's what we go by rather more when we educate people in the organization in terms of how are you doing on these dimensions? Do you get what you want to learn in this organization? Fantastic. And uh, last question uh, um, on this topic. Uh, do you have any particular pa uh, plans to further improve these results? Anything exciting that you think is worth mentioning? <laughs> I want to give these um, folks the opportunity to um, get out of their analyst silo uh, and actually become, uh, let's say, more well-rounded in terms of be a salesperson, be a coach, um, be somebody from operations, be able to really see and feel that side. So that's what I'm looking for in the work that we are acquiring for the team. Um, what gives them ample opportunity to grow across their competency, let's say, so that they don't silo deep in, but they also go broad and see, hey, what does this actually do? What levers am I moving with my work? How does this feel to be selling? You know, and that's what I think we we should pass on to every single one that works in this organization. How do you grow yourself as a person and a professional outside of analytics, just to give them that learning opportunity. So that's what I have in mind for this team to grow. Sounds like a very healthy approach and I'm sure that it will bring you a lot of success and, and, and good luck with that. And uh, Catherine, I think uh, we arrived at the final stage of, of the interview, uh, which is the quick fire round. So during the quick fire round, I always ask our guests just a couple questions and you would have 30 seconds to, to give me an amazing answer. So uh, whenever you're ready, I'm, um, I'm ready to shoot the first question. I'm ready. Let's go. Brilliant. So the first question is, what is the biggest mistake that you almost made? Not accepting BCG's offer. I had one that was paying far more. Um, I was tempted, yet I was glad I didn't take it. Okay. Uh, and what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? And you can't say that take the offer from BCG. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I won't. Um, it's actually from somebody um, I do not necessarily like as a person or as a professional. However, that piece of advice was brilliant. Put yourself in the shoes of your opposite and really do it. Don't just think about it. Really do it. Really emphasize. Best piece of advice I've ever gotten. Very mindful. And uh, next question is, uh, what is your most influential book and why? It's actually not a book. It's a magazine. It's a monthly um, subscription I'm having. The magazine is called Brand 1. It's a German one, obviously, and it is about organizational change and transformation. It's uh, very insightful, and it's really one of my guides to how I work and how I understand uh, leadership. Brand 1. 
Okay, yeah. Uh, behind uh, eyes. It's, it's behind brand eyes. one. Okay, it's brand one. <laughs> well, we, we'll make sure to leave a, a link in the show notes so uh, our German-speaking audience members can check it out for themselves. Thank you. <laughs> yes, and uh, the next question is, who is your most influential public figure? It can be a living or, or, or a dead person, and, and, uh, and why? Uh, so it's Michael Gorbachev. Uh, I had the opportunity to see him in person at the university I studied at. He, had, he held a very inspirational speech. Um, and that, that's something that really guides me to today. If you believe in something, it sounds pretty American, but if you believe in something, make it happen. Don't just take the straight road. See how you can work around, find compromises, yet do not lose focus. That's why Michael Gorbachev is, is one of my most inspirational figures. Yeah, I can definitely understand why. And uh, next question is, what is your favorite quote and how do you put it into practice? Um, my most favorite quote um, is actually teach the people how to fish. Um, it is also, if you want another one, because I've repeated that one, um, the answer is 42. That's the quote that I always give to people who do not understand analytics. I'm like, if you, if you proceed, pursue this like you do, you will get something that says the answer is 42. How do, you, how do you like that? How does that solve your problem? And then usually you have a better part of the conversation following that. Yeah, sound, sounds very constructive. <laughs> and the last question is, uh, what advice would you give to new and inspiring data leaders? Always think impact. Never let yourself be derailed by fancy models, fancy technology, fancy talking. What is the impact? And that's what will count in the end. And um, what I always say is size to fit. Do not size to impress. Perfect. I think uh, that's, a, uh, that's a brilliant thought. To, to finish on. And uh, Catherine, it was uh, a fascinating conversation. So it was great to, to have you on the show. Uh, do you have anything else that you would like to uh, leave our audience with? Well, thanks to everyone. I hope I wasn't too preachy, but I'm trying to share the, the best thoughts I've had and, and try to not have people trip into the same gutters that I tripped into. And um, I hope it was helpful. Um, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to be on the show. It, it was our pleasure. And uh, yeah, it was full of actionable insights. And uh, yeah, I actually wanted to have the conversation. So to, to, to bring the preacher out of you, right? Because you are definitely someone who, you know, we can listen to and we should when it comes to organizational transformation in analytics. So Catherine, it's been a, a genuine pleasure. And uh, we'll hope to see you next time. Thank you. I would love to. 